From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! So today is a good day. It's the day I finally get to look at the man that I love and finally say, will you please marry me? <laughs> In a pair of major rulings, the Supreme Court overturns a law that denied federal benefits to same-sex couples and clears the way for same-sex marriage to resume in California. An 84-year-old widow named Edith Windsor brought the challenge to the Defense of Marriage Act. Children born today will grow up in a world without DOMA. And those same children who happen to be gay will be free to love and get married, as Thea and I did, but with the same federal benefits, protections, and dignity as everyone else. If I had to survive Thea, what a glorious way to do it. And she would be so pleased. We'll be joined by a married couple in California who've worked for years to legalize same-sex marriage. Then we speak with filmmaker Yoruba Richin about her film, The New Black, how African-American community is grappling with LGBT rights and the campaign to legalize same-sex marriage in Maryland. And we'll speak with her about her film, Promised Land, about land reform in South Africa. Then Cecile Richards, head of Planned Parenthood. <laughs> was Cecile Richards inside the Texas State House after protesters helped block the passage of a bill that would have closed most of the state's abortion clinics. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. In a historic victory for LGBT movement, the Supreme Court has struck down the Defense of Marriage Act and paved the way for same-sex marriages to resume in California. In a 5-4 decision, the court ruled the 1996 Defense of Marriage Act, or DOMA, signed by President Clinton into law, is unconstitutional. This means legally married same-sex couples are entitled to claim the same 1,100 federal benefits as heterosexual couples. The lead plaintiff in the case, 84-year-old Edie Windsor, hailed the ruling. I'm honored and humbled and overjoyed to be here today to represent not only the thousands of Americans whose lives, whose lives have been adversely impacted by the Defense of Marriage Act, but those whose hopes and dreams have been constricted by the same discriminatory law. Children born today will grow up in a world without DOMA. And those same children who happen to be gay will be free to love and get married, as Thea and I did, but with the same federal benefits, protections and dignity as everyone else. Edith Windsor sued the federal government after she was forced to pay additional estate taxes because it did not recognize her marriage to her wife, the Aspire. Just minutes after DOMA was struck down, a New York City immigration judge stopped the deportation hearing of a gay Colombian man married to a U.S. citizen. Although Sean and Stephen Brooks were legally married in New York, federal law did not recognize their union. An intern at the law firm representing the couple ran five blocks to hand the Supreme Court's ruling to the judge right after it was posted online. Minutes after DOMA was struck down, the Supreme Court also ruled supporters of the Proposition 8 ban on same-sex marriage in California do not have standing to appeal a lower court ruling that overturned it. This effectively gives the green light for same-sex weddings to proceed in California, the most populous state in the country. We'll have more on the Supreme Court decisions after headlines. Ecuador is facing U.S. pressure to reject the asylum bid of NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden. On Wednesday, Democratic Senator Robert Menendez, chair of the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee, said welcoming Snowden would severely jeopardize U.S. trade preferences for Ecuador. Menendez said, quote, our government will not reward countries for bad behavior. Ecuador's foreign minister, Ricardo Patino, meanwhile, says his government could take anywhere between a few days to a few months to decide on Snowden. Snowden's asylum bid. Snowden's believed to remain in a transit area of a Moscow airport. On Wednesday, Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel said Snowden has damaged the U.S. and urged Russia to hand him over. I would uh, uh, hope that the Russians do the right thing here and um, uh, turn Snowden over uh, to the United States. General Dempsey said to uh, uh, others, uh, yes, there was damage done. Uh, to, to this country by the Snowden leaks, and um, 
we are assessing that uh, now. But make no mistake, uh, uh, this violation uh, of our laws was a, a serious security breach in our national security apparatus. President Obama has kicked off his three-nation tour of Africa in Senegal. His trip is beginning with a visit to Gori Island, the port from where African slaves were forcibly sent to the United States. Obama is due to visit South Africa, where former President Nelson Mandela remains hospitalized in critical condition. South African President Jacob Zuma canceled a foreign trip and visited Mandela in the hospital Wednesday. His condition is said to have worsened in the last 36 hours, his family reportedly making preparations for his funeral. The Senate's approved an amendment to the immigration reform bill that radically expands enforcement along the U.S.-Mexico border. The $46 billion measure would nearly double the number of border agents to 40,000, expand the use of drones, and construct around 700 miles of border fencing. The amendment was approved by an overwhelming vote of 69 to 29. Republicans introduced it in a bid to win their colleagues' support for the immigration bill's broader proposal to extend an eventual path to citizenship to millions of undocumented people. But now a number of immigrant rights groups are voicing concerns the added security requirements are so extreme they undermine the bill overall. In a statement, leaders of the nation's largest Latino advocacy group, Presente.org, said they cannot support the immigration bill, quote, in good conscience, as if it's also guaranteed to increase death and destruction through increased militarization of the border, unquote. The Mexican government also voicing similar concerns. In his first public statements on the new requirements, Foreign Minister Jose Antonio Mead criticized the building of more barriers along the border. We're convinced that a wall is not a solution for the migration phenomena and it is not congruent with a modern and secure border. It does not contribute to the development of a competitive region that both countries are looking for and support. Final passage of the Senate immigration bill could come as early as today. It faces an uncertain future in the House, where Speaker John Boehner has said he won't allow a vote without a majority of Republican support. Texas has carried out its 500th execution and the first in the U.S. of a woman prisoner in nearly three years. Kimberly McCarthy was executed for the 1997 murder of a neighbor. She won a reprieve earlier this year as lawmakers considered a bill affecting the composition of juries. McCarthy, who was black, was convicted by a jury of 11 whites and one African American. Defense attorneys say the jury was improperly selected on the basis of race. The New York City Council's approved a landmark measure to increase oversight of the police department and expand safeguards against profiling. The Community Safety Act creates an independent inspector general to oversee the NYPD and broadens the definition of biased profiling to include age, gender, housing status and sexual orientation. New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg has promised to veto the measure, but it passed with enough support to override him should he strike it down. The CIA has acknowledged four former officers were embedded with the New York City Police Department, despite a ban on the agency's involvement in domestic spying. According to The New York Times, one of the officers helped conduct local surveillance, but justified his role because he was on unpaid leave of absence. The findings were contained in a summary of an internal CIA probe in 2011 that cleared the CIA and NYPD of wrongdoing after their collaboration was revealed. In the years after 9-11, the CIA helped the NYPD develop a so-called demographics unit that used informants to spy on Muslims. The Electronic Privacy Information Center, which helped obtain the probe's findings, said, quote, despite the assurances of the CIA's press office, the activities documented in this report cross the line into domestic surveillance and highlight the need for more oversight. The federal courts dismissed a lawsuit filed by four former Iraqi prisoners at Abu Ghraib against the military contractor Khaki International. The men have accused the firm's employees of taking part in the torture and abuse of prisoners. 
One of the plaintiffs, an Iraqi farmer, alleges he was caged, beaten, threatened with dogs and given electric shocks during more than four years in U.S. detention. In dismissing the suit, the presiding judge cited the recent Supreme Court decision to restrict lawsuits under the Alien Tort Statute against corporations for abuses on foreign soil. Another contractor, Angility Holdings, formerly known as L3 Services and before that Titan Corporation, agreed to pay more than five million dollar settlement to 71 former Abu Ghraib prisoners last year. In a statement, the Center for Constitutional Rights, which helped bring the suit, said, quote, the court's ruling effectively creates lawless spaces where even U.S.-based entities can commit torture and war crimes with impunity. A number of activists with the group Code Pink were arrested at the White House Wednesday in a protest for the closure of Guantanamo Bay Prison. The group's co-founder, Diane Wilson, was arrested after scaling the White House fence and attempting to deliver a letter to the White House front door. Wilson's on a liquid-only fast in solidarity with hunger-striking Guantanamo prisoners. And the second-degree murder trial of George Zimmerman for killing unarmed African-American teenager Trayvon Martin continues in Florida. On Wednesday, Trayvon's friend, Rachel Gentile, took the stand to testify about her phone conversation with Trayvon just before Zimmerman shot him dead. Gentile said Trayvon described Zimmerman as a creepy man who was following him. She said Trayvon's last words were, get off, get off, before the line went dead. Her testimony continues today. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world.